Okay, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Right at the end of the carbohydrate chapter, you may have noticed a section 2410 on N-glycosides. So we're gonna pick that up and expand on it a little bit as we talk about DNA. So this is an expanded section 2410. So nucleic acids, this is what makes up RNA and DNA, as well as a bunch of other biological molecules. And so we're going to aim to understand their structure and their function. So what makes us us is our DNA. This encodes the genes that make the proteins that turn us into who we are. And we're going to skip over a lot of the biology and simply focus on the structures. So from your biology, you may be familiar that each DNA is composed of genes, which are small individual segments of the DNA that, con that contain instructions for the synthesis of a polypeptide or a protein that we'll talk about in the next section. And so our our genes are found in chromosomes and there's a whole order of leveling of these nucleic acids. But uh, either talk about that in biochemistry or in biology. For us, what we wanna do is understand the structure of these molecules. So when we talk about nucleic acids, uh, these are polymers, also known as polynucleotides. There's two types of these nucleic acids deoxyribonucleic acids and ribonucleic acids. And each of these nucleotides has three parts. So a five-membered cyclic monosaccharide, so a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and a nucleo and a phosphate group, sorry. So we want to understand those structures. So let's start with the composition of the sugar. In RNA, the sugar is D-ribose. And so you can see it drawn here in its furanose form. It's a five-membered ring. If we look at the anomeric carbon, you can tell that it is an aldo sugar. You can see that it comes from a D sugar. And both the OHs off the ring are pointed down. So ribose was one of the four sugars that we needed to know. And uh, that is where the ribo comes from in ribonucleic acid. In DNA, it's actually a 2-deoxy ribose. So the difference is at this 2 position here, there is no longer an OH there. And this is indicated the name deoxyribo of deoxyribonucleic acid. So in RNA, the R stands for ribose, and in DNA, the D stands for the deoxyribo. And so you should be able to recognize the difference between those, and the DNA is lacking that two prime hydroxyl group. In fact, that conveys to DNA some extra stability that you don't find in RNA. And now we look at the bases. And so there's two general classifications for the bases, known as the pyrimidine bases. And you can see that structure here, where it looks like a pyridine, but at the position three, we actually have another nitrogen there. So it's not pyridine, it is a pyrimidine. And then you have the purine base, which looks an awful lot like the pyrimidine. It just has this additional five-membered ring appended to it. So you have the pyrimidine bases and the purine bases. And of the pyrimidine bases, there are three, cytosine, thiamine, and uracil. And yes, you should know all these structures and be able to draw them. And then of the purine bases, there are two, adenine and guanine. And so it's interesting that the primidines actually have three bases. And the reason for that is that in DNA and RNA, they both have cytosine 
in them. Now DNA, while lacking that two prime hydroxy group, also contains thymine and RNA contains uracil. So those are a couple differences between DNA and RNA. RNA contains uracil and also contains ribose. DNA contains thymine and lacks a two prime hydroxy group on the sugar there. So these are the bases. You notice essentially what we've got is small bases here and larger bases here. And that's gonna be important later on. So as I said, you should know the structures. And so what I've done is try to break it down so that you can generalize the structures. So what they all have in common is this pyrimidine base here. And in fact, we can actually break it down even further where they all have this structure in common for cytosine, uracil, and thymine. And then what we simply do is change the group off of here, so X, where X is either one of these two groups. So we can have an amine pointed off the top, and that's what this is showing, is that we just replace that top group with an amine, or we can replace it with kind of this amide looking group. And so what we end up with is either a nitrogen on top with a double bond adjacent to it, or we end up with a C double bond O on top and the adjacent nitrogen is as an NH. Now the difference with thymine is it's just like uracil except it has this CH3. Again, thymine is what is found in DNA. And it's really interesting because it takes a lot more energy to make thymine. So there must be some importance of having a methyl group there. Now the purine bases, we can do the same. So we got purine up here. Now this is kind of the general structure. And then what we can do is replace this top group here with either one of these two or we could also append this group. So if we wanna make adenine, what we do is we simply add this group up there on top and you can see that we had adenine. And if we're going to make guanine, what we do is add this group, but we also add this one to the side. So the point of all this is, well, you need to know these structures down here, but they're very similar in the parts that they use. You'll notice that cytosine and guanine both have the same motif at the top and uracil and thymine and guanine both have this or all have that same group at the top. What you could say is that guanine is a little bit different because he also contains this amine off the side. So he's actually kind of a combination of both of these structural features right here as the nitrogen with the adjacent C double bond O and then the nitro nitrogen with the double bond to a amine group out there. So these structures again are fairly, fairly, are fairly similar. Now what we find is that G and C are what we refer to as base pairs. And what's interesting about that is you notice that for G and C, the top groups are opposite. One has a nitrogen and one has a C double bond O. And then the side groups, the other one has a C double bond O and the guanine actually has this amine. We'll find out that U and A are base pairs. And again, they have this opposite arrangement on top, uracil has a C double bond O and the adenine has the amine. And then the same for thymine has a C double bond O and adenine has the amine. Now, we notice that there's no group here off of adenine where there is in guanine. And we'll explain the ramifications of that soon. So nucleotides and nucleic acids. 
So these are the parts that they are composed of. We've got ribose and deoxyribose and purine and pyrimidine bases, specifically adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And their respective macromolecule that they're found in is listed down below. So when we start putting these together, if we put two of the parts together, we get what is referred to as a nucleoside. So nucleosides are just the base combined with the sugar. And when we go to name them, if we are derived from a pyrimidine base, we end in I-D-I-N-E. If we are making a nucleoside from a purine base, then we end in O-S-I-N-E. And then we can identify if it is a deoxy sugar by appending that to the front. So this one here is from cytosine, but we've now made a nucleoside, so it's called cytidine. It's a ribonucleotide. Down here at the bottom, we're gonna combine a deoxy sugar with adenine, and it becomes deoxyadenosine. Okay, so we're actually connecting this nitrogen to that anomeric carbon right there. So this is a chemistry that we'll need to understand. This is actually uh, done biologically, and these are referred to as N-glycosidic linkages because we're linking in a glycosidic bond to a nitrogen, so N-glycosides. So here is a picture of the nucleosides. Again, nucleosides are the base and the sugar. And so you can see them laid out, adenosine, guanosine, cytidine, and uridine, and then the deoxy down at the bottom. And we indicate that they have the deoxy sugar by saying two prime deoxy adenosine, two prime deoxy guanosine, two prime deoxy cytidine, and thymidine. Okay, and the reason that we don't have to put the de two deoxy here is we know that thymidine is actually only found in DNA. Okay, so nucleosides have two parts, but nucleotides actually have three. So nucleotides include an additional part, and that is a phosphate group. And that phosphate can either be found at the five prime position or the three prime. And when we talk about prime positions, what we're doing is actually numbering the sugar. If we numbered around the ring, those are numbered from one to six. If we're on the sugar, we don't want to confuse the numbers, so we refer to these as prime. So two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. And so that phosphate group can either be included on the OH at the five prime position, or on the O at the three prime position. And you can see here, we've got a ribonucleotide, and here we've got a deoxyribonucleotide. So again, these are nucleotides that contain all three parts, the nitrogen amine base, the sugar, and the phosphate. Nucleosides only have two, and so here we go from a nucleoside, we add the phosphate, and now we have a nucleotide. So a nucleotide is the nucleoside plus the phosphate. And so you should understand that the difference between those definitions between a nucleoside and a nucleotide and what the three parts of a nucleotide are. So in naming nucleosides and nucleotides, you can have actually more than one phosphate linked together. So off to the right, we have a molecule that is adenosine five prime phosphate, but we could have just one phosphate and we would refer to that as adenosine monophosphate, or you may have heard of it before as AMP, or we could have adenosine diphosphate which you may have heard of before as ADP or adenosine triphosphate, which you hopefully have heard of before as ATP. 
Now, since these are ribonucleotides, they're just referred to as uh, just their abbreviations, AMP, ADP, ATP. If they were deoxy sugars, then we'd refer to them as DAMP, DAMP, DADP, or DATP. So the ones that you're most familiar with are going to be these ribonucleotides, AMP, ADP, and ATP. And again, that M, D, or T, mono, di, or tri just refers to the number of phosphate linkages there. The five prime indicates that it's connected to the five prime oxygen. Now this is just more for fun. So uh, I'm trying to figure out where these names come from. We actually have the sugar and you can see over here, I've tried to identify that if it's in DNA, we refer to that as a deoxyribose. And so that finds its way into the nucleoside name and the nucleotide name. And then we have the bases. So these are the nitrogenous bases and you can see those down here at the bottom. So you have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And then we also have the type of base that it is. So adenine is a purine base. And so when we go to name it, for this case here, we indicate it's a deoxy, aden coming from adenine, and then osine, I-N-E coming from the purine base. And then let's just say that we had cytosine. And so we would actually name it as a deoxycytadene, where the idene E-N-E -E comes from the pyrimidine base. And then of course we can append on the location of the phosphate there. So hopefully from this color coding you can see where all the the names come from. So for example down here this deoxy that comes from the lack of an OH there. Thymidine comes because it has this arrangement of this C double bond O right there and that CH3. The IDINE comes because it's a pyrimidine base, which is that purple structure right there. And the five prime phosphate comes because of that. So just more FYI, interesting to know where all these names come from. And then you can see their abbreviations over here as well. So there are other important nucleotides besides being found in DNA. And as I said, ATP is one of those you've probably commonly heard of. And ATP actually undergoes an interesting reaction where this OH on the three prime position can attack that phosphate and kick the other pyrophosphate. That's what we refer to as the two phosphates together. Pyrophosphate, you kick that out and you end up with cyclic AMP. Again, if you've had biology classes, you've likely heard of cyclic AMP, C-CAMP, or CAMP, which is a second messenger. And so very important biological molecules. And these nucleotides are also found in NADH, NADPH. Uh, we've talked about those a little bit before in the past, some FAD, FADH2, FMN, and FM. H2, so all biologically important reagents. So in our body, we don't have sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. What we use to do reductions is NADH. And again, that's what biochemistry talks about. Our main purpose here is to understand the structures and the differences between them. And so here is a summary of all the parts. So the difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide the difference between DNA and RNA. So those are the individual structures, but really where the power of these structures comes into play is their ability to form base pairs. So when they're trying to figure out the genetic material, because we knew information was passed from mother to son and father to daughter, they were trying to figure out what molecule it was. For a long time, they thought it was proteins because proteins seemed very complex and had a lot of information there, but they couldn't come up with the mechanism of how that information was transferred from parents to uh, offspring. They did make some interesting discoveries. 
uh, Erwin Shargroff uh, determined that the number of adenines equals the number of thymines and that the number of guanines equals the number of cytosines. But in between organisms, that percentage varies quite a bit. So maybe 40% of one organism was composed of adenines and thymines, meaning 20% adenine, 20% thymines. And then the other 60% was guanines and cytosines, 30% guanines and 30% cytosines. And then in another organism, it would be 50-50. And so not every organism had the same number of adenines and guanines. That percentage differed but the percentage of adenines and thymines tended to be equal. And so eventually, after a long drawn out process, they figured out that there was some base pairing, that adenine base paired with thymine. And when they started looking at the structures, lo and behold, their hydrogen bond patterns matched up. And also for cytosine, the hydrogen bond patterns matched up. And as I mentioned before, guanine actually has this extra group down here that adenine doesn't. And so it can actually form an additional base pair. So you may be familiar with, with hydrogen bonding and that the CG forms three base pairs and that the AT only forms two. Okay, so you should also know how these base pair structures form. And so you should be able to draw a thymine adenine base pair as well as a cytosine guanine base pair. Now included in the module of biochemistry information that you need to know is a study guide of all the material that you need to know and some hints on how to draw these base pairs as well as amino acids that we'll soon talk about. So yes, you should be able to draw these as base pairs and show how they uh, form these hydrogen bonds. And so as I said, in that study guide is some guidance on that. And so what we've got here are the actual CG base pairs and the UA base pairs and how to draw them. And then what I've done beneath is just remove the electrons so to make it just a little bit clearer to see. And then down here at the bottom, giving you the arrangement without the bonds and then you can figure it out. If you notice, there's always these hydrogens lined up. It really is who is owning those hydrogens. And so in this case here, the guanine owns the nitrogen, or the, the hydrogens on the bottom half, and the cytosine owns the nitrogens, or the hydrogen at the top half. So hopefully you can use these. And again, this C and U, you see without any decorations, it's the exact same structure. So if cytosine has the amine up here, then uracil must have the U. If guanine has a C double bond O up here, then adenine has to be opposite and have the nitrogen up there. So this is just a way to practice drawing these structures out. Okay, so this uh, base pairing allows DNA to form a double helix, which was first proposed by Watson and Crick in 1953. And we're not going to talk much about the structure of DNA since we're short on time, but they do run in an anti-parallel fashion. And so you've probably heard of five prime ends and three prime ends before. And those, again, just refer to this numbering around the sugar. Again, we use the prime just to indicate that we're numbering the sugars. And if you just use regular numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, or whatever, you would be numbering the nitrogenous bases. And so these actually run in anti-parallel fashion to each other. And then that allows these base pairs to form. So again, the A and T base pair forms uh, two hydrogen bonds where the G and C forms three.
Then again, just another example of that. And this is, you'll often see just these little cartoons here. But now, and hopefully by the test, you'll actually be able to draw out these structures here and show what a GC base pair looks like at the atomic level, as well as an AT base pair. And why GC has three base pairs and why AT only has uh, two base pairs. And so we'll leave it at that. There's your brief introduction into nucleic acids.